Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, 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 morning. Everybody survived the cold? No, no, we didn't. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> um, good to be here. And it's not, it's not that bad, right? We, we made it. We're good. Um, so today we're, we're going we're gonna to be in Psalm 148 today. Um, and we're also going to take a little cue from the shepherds. Um, and, and coming from some manager position in my previous life, um, those shepherds are irresponsible. <laughs> they left a whole bunch of sheep. And that's, that's their priority one, number one job right there is, is those sheep. And they, <laughs> they just leave them. Um, it's just kind of funny. But we're going we're gonna to take a, a cue from them because uh, they got so great and, and a powerful message and vision of worship from the angels uh, that they just had to. That it drew their eyes, their physical eyes, away from their responsibilities, uh, but it drew their eyes to Jesus, more importantly, uh, and their internal eyes of their heart, even, uh, towards Jesus, and directed them into praise, which is uh, kind of the, the main point today, uh, right up front here, is we can be drawn uh, to praise Jesus when we see the universal extent of his praise. And we'll kind of unpack that today uh, from Psalm 148. Um, and it, you'll see it in two points from Psalm 148. Um, and, and, and when we see it, when we, when we read through this, this, this chapter, um, this psalm, uh, you'll kind of see that, uh, that if we're not praising, that we're, we're kind of the, the odd ones out at a football game or at a, at a stadium when everybody else is going nuts. And then you're just kind of sitting there, or we are just kind of sitting there, and I am sometimes kind of sitting there, um, like I do at home with other sporting events. I just kind of sit there and, and just watch it and don't really say anything. <laughs> um, but you'll see that, that there's this entire stadium uh, of the universe around, uh, around us that is, that is praising Jesus, that has their eyes focused on him. And, uh, and when we see that, we see why, and, and we're drawn in. Uh, so we'll be in one Psalm 148. So we can be drawn to praise Jesus when we see the universal extent of his praise. Point one, hopefully you're there, Psalm 148, uh, the heights of his praise, when we see the heights of his praise. So let me read Psalm 148, uh, one through, uh, let's see, six. Praise the Lord. That's the word hallelujah, if you didn't know. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest of heavens. Praise you, waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Psalm 148. So we see here that, that the heights that he starts from, the heights that the psalmist starts from, is the heavens. It's, it's basically where, where Jesus is, where, where God sits, he resides. If you are in the heavens, you are in the presence uh, of God there. Praise him, all his angels. It's all the angels that we, we saw. They, they came down and they talked to these shepherds. They're like, hey, the Messiah just got born over there. Go look. Go check it out. Praise him, all his hosts. This is just everybody else uh, that's in, in the in the heavens. Because you always see uh, cherubim, like the just the weird angels that we can't really put words to. That have eyes all over and wings all over. Those guys, those guys too. Uh, they're all praising him. Praise him, sun and moon. And here's here's where we take steps down. This whole this whole psalm kind of takes steps down as, as we go down. Um, praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, highest of heavens, praise and praise you, waters above the heavens. So what he's doing here uh, is, is taking Genesis. He's taking Genesis 1 and starting to pull ideas and pull things from Genesis 1, saying, yeah, the sun and moon, he, he made them, and they praise him. He made those things. Even the waters above the heavens, you'll see that phrase. It's kind of confusing. Uh, but it's in Genesis 1. That's how it kind of pulls us there. And like, oh, yeah, I remember Genesis 1 where God created the heavens and the earth. 
I remember that. Even cultures, so this is a good thing uh, to know, even other cultures in that time, even in our time, uh, they, they praise those things, right? They see those things as, as gods, and they have sun gods and moon gods, and they praise those things. So part of what Genesis is doing, and even this psalm, is pulling the eyes away from those, like, no, that's, that's not actually a god. That is, that is something that was made by the one true god. So pulling our eyes away from away from those other things. And then in verses 5 and 6, we see the reason why. The reason why. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He is their creator. And he established them forever and ever, and he gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. He is their sustainer. And it's not like our abilities to create where you build a shed and like, hey, it stands up for a while until it gets really cold and it falls over. You know, like we have like the the equivalent creation and sustaining abilities of my two year old daughter with big Lego blocks. She'll she'll put them together. She'll make this tower that's about her height, and she'll be like, Dad, I made a tower, and then it falls over, it goes everywhere. You know, that's kind of thing. Or she'll build a bridge that doesn't actually connect, and they'll call it a bridge, and that, that's kind of our 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 creation and our sustaining abilities compared to his. He's so much better than, than us at creating those things. And it's not just talking about physical realities, like, yes, I am, I'm created, I have stuff <laughs> that, I, that I have material that I'm, I'm made of, but he creates, he creates souls, he creates faith. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He creates things that, that aren't just material things. But we are constantly in this culture drawn to and, and told to and expected to create and sustain other things, including ourselves. But the angels didn't announce your birth or my birth or anybody else's birth. They announced his birth. These things worship him because he creates and sustains. It really makes sense when the creator of the universe comes down and is incarnated as a child, as a baby, and then all these angels come. And there's a star that displays his location of where he was born. It makes sense now, like he's the creator of the universe. And you think of John 1, 3, where it's Christ who is the creator and sustainer of the universe. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So nothing. If you look at it, Jesus, Jesus made it. He did it. <laughs> he's, he's saying Jesus is God, and he, he made it. He was there at the beginning. He made all of it. So the heights of God's praise all the way to heaven, they point to Christ. They're looking at Christ and praising him. And I said we would get there, right? We would get there. He can... We can praise him when we see those things because he created and sustained you. He creates and sustains you. He is your creator and your sustainer. Not just of your physical being, but of your faith, your life around you. He creates and sustains those things. So to get us worshiping, I want, I want to ask us uh, a couple of questions um, who do you think your creator and sustainer is? Like I just said, yeah, Jesus is your creator and sustainer, but functionally, when you look at your life, who, is, who, are you, who do you think is creating and sustaining your life? There's a lot of pressure out there to be a self-made person, to find your dream and go for it, to, to keep your economic status, to keep your level of sanity in life, even during Christmas. Who is the creator and sustainer of your life? Another question that's, that's similar to keep us thinking, do you know him as your creator and sustainer? He keeps planets in orbit by telling them once. He started and keeps chemical reactions going by his declaration. He has the whole universe in his hands. It's a good song. Is this how you know Jesus? Or is he a nice centerpiece for your nativity scene? 
that as a child you just can't fit through that lens of do you know him the one who came as a child incarnated do you know him as your creator and sustainer and that's that's why the angels came that's why there's a star there's everybody's pointing to him this psalm is pointing to him do you know him as your creator and sustainer so let me give you a little practical step with that. Leave some sheep. Be an irresponsible shepherd and go look. Leave some sheep. Leave a responsibility that you have that you feel like you need to create or to sustain, and then go look at Jesus. Go do a Devo. Go read some scripture. There's a ton of things right now uh, online for, for devotion. There's one from Biola that has art, music, poetry, and all this stuff with it to kind of help you see, get the, get the artistic side of that, and help you see Christ through it. Don't answer that email yet. Go look at Jesus. Leave that sheep. Walk away from the turkey. Walk away from the kitchen. Go be with Jesus. Leave that sheep, and then you can come back to the sheep. Only having seen Jesus, and like the, like the shepherd said, they came back glorifying and praising him. What if, you could, what if you could create dinner for your family glorifying and praising God instead of cursing the turkey and how it's still frozen or something like that? So leave some sheep. Give it a shot. Because we're sheep, we forget, like, I know this is kind of an easy, uh, an easy application. Go do your devotions or go be with Jesus. But sometimes we forget and we need to be reminded and push towards that, to push towards the creator and sustainer of the universe. So leave some sheep. Go see how he is so good, how he's the creator and sustainer of the universe, and, and find out why and be drawn into why these things, these celestial objects and these angels who are with him in heaven why they praise him we are drawn into into praising jesus by seeing the heights of his universal praise because we see the heights of his creative abilities of his sustaining abilities and then we see ourselves in that <clears throat> he sustains even your life and creates even your life and he even sustains the sheep when you leave them seeing the heights of his praise. Uh, point two, uh, we see the depths of his praise. Uh, we can be drawn into praising God when we see the depths of his praise. So pulling back to the text, uh, and it's going to continue down. It's going to continue down it, from heavens, and now we get to praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all the deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all, all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, his majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all the saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We see this continual, uh, just gradual decline down as, as, as the psalmist pulls out more things that, that even draw us back to the Genesis, Genesis account still. Praise him, the earth, great sea, sea creatures, that's in there. The deeps. Fire and hail, think of lightning when you, when you read fire. Snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his words. Mountains, hills, fruit trees, everything on earth, the earth itself is praising him. All of it. And again, he's smashing idols here. Baal, the, the, Baal, the great God that, that's in the Old Testament, that people are drawn away from the true God and to worship him. Baal is the storm god. Verse 8, fire, hail, snow, mist, stormy wind, all fulfilling his word. Not Baal's word. He's pulling, pulling us away 
from those other objects, those other things that we worship, even pulling away people from literal things that they worship. You think of Elijah on Mount Carmel when they're trying to call down rain from heaven and the prophets of Baal can't do it. Well, Baal's the storm god and he's failing. And then the true God does it. This, this verse can remind us of that. And he keeps going down and then he gets to kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers, young men, maidens together, old men and children. This is everybody. There's nobody not included in this list or assumed to be included. And then verse 13 and 14 show us why. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His name, his whole person, his whole being, what he's about, his reputation, that's his name. We see it, and it's, he's exalted above everybody. He trumps everybody. Nobody is better than him. You think of people that walk into a room, and you, they own the room, right? They walk in, and they sit. And just by their presence and their reputation and their, their demeanor, you can tell, oh, they're a confident person. They're owning this room. Like, they're working it a little bit. And we have articles telling us to do that, right? There's a Forbes article, How to Work a Room Like You Own the Place. This is saying, for his name alone is exalted, God owns every room. He walks in, everybody looks. He walks in, the whole room is directed towards him. His majesty is above all the earth, his beauty, his glory, nothing compares. I remember uh, a picture I saw of the Hubble Space Telescope looking out into what they call deep space, which all of it's kind of deep. I don't know why they call it deep space. But it's, it looks like stars. It's looked like a bunch of stars just everywhere. And the tagline was, those are galaxies. Billions of stars. And just put in awe by that picture. This verse is telling me, nah. They all praise him. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Those things pale in comparison to him. And then we get to verse 14, the horn. Um, there's some exege exegetical possibilities with the horn. It's it could be an animal horn, it could be a spire of a crown, but it, it metaphorically means that it's strength and power. That God raises up strength and power for his people. But I'll tell you today, the, the whole thing's about him. The horn is Jesus. We even see that in uh, first, uh, Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things, the church, his body the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. This is talking about Jesus, even Zechariah. Zechariah is the, in, in the beginning chapters of Luke, Zechariah is the prophet uh, who, who's the father of uh, John the Baptist. And he sees John the Baptist, right? And he's holding the little kid. And then he says, he finally gets to speak. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He's talking about Jesus, not John. He sees that there's one coming that's, that is the horn of salvation, that will work out salvation for everybody. He's the one who saves. Jesus is the horn, the, the strong, powerful horn who works salvation for us. And then we see the problem, and we kind of feel that problem. We're like, wait, 11 and 12, kings of the earth, all peoples. All peoples are not praising God. It's kind of a contrast with, with the rest of the, the psalm. This is kind of uh, hallelujah, which is the, the verb here, is, a, is an imperative telling people to praise. And the other ones are. We see that in Revelation. We see that everywhere, that everything in creation is praising God. But then we see people, and we see that they're not. We just see that they're not praising God. 
We see that there are some shepherds that see Jesus and worship him, and we see that there are some Herods that see Jesus and go and want him gone. We see that there are worshipers now, but we see some who don't see his majesty or his, his power and his, his salvation. There are people who might not be praising him. The bad part and the problem, the real problem, is that we are in this boat. We praise other things and aren't praising him. And the depths help us see that the depths of his praise need to go down to us, ourselves. That's how far down they go. Not to little atoms, not to small things, but to you. Internally, it starts. It comes all the way down to you. Let me get the slides going. His praise finds a voice in you when you see Christ. So this whole psalm, it's pointing to him. It's saying, hey, look at Jesus. Look at this horn of salvation. Look at the creator and sustainer of the universe saying, look at him, go. Like the angel is telling the shepherds, go look at him. So the question I have for you to help bring this to, to your heart level, what else is your heart looking at? Our eyes can go all over. We can look at a bunch of things, and our eyes are directed by our heart. And our, but our heart can look at one thing. What else are your eyes looking at? The eyes of your heart are looking at. I'll be very honest. This last couple of months, I've been looking forward to a break. Uh, Christmas time is a little low for me uh, in school and in, in ministry stuff. I've been looking forward to a break. How incredibly worthless compared to Christ. My heart was so focused on something in a few weeks or in a month or something that looks like rest that it fails to see the actual one who gives rest. I desired that time more than I desired him. I worshiped a restful time, a low, calm week instead of him. And this the psalm is saying, no, that's ridiculous. There's nothing that compares to the one who gives rest. The other question for you, what is your next big milestone that you're looking forward to? What is your next big milestone? We all have those things, right? We're looking down the road. We see, oh, there is a rest. There's, there's a time when Christmas is done, family goes home, and I have a week, a couple of days, an hour or two to sit down, take a break. Retirement's coming up, a couple of years. We'll have enough saved. We'll be okay. I won't have to work the rest of this, the rest of my life. Let's look forward to that. I look forward to having a kid, buying a house, getting married, having a, a better relationship with my spouse. I think there's a ton of different big milestones that we are looking forward to. And here's my challenge: replace that with Jesus. It sounds simple. But when we see he's the creator and sustainer of the universe, is he's better than everybody else. His name is exalted above everything. He's so good we can't even comprehend it. Yeah, we should, we should want that to be. We should want our eyes, our eyes of our heart to look at Jesus. And it might be difficult and you might recognize his goodness later and his faithfulness later and why these these, everything on earth is praising him later, but it's a challenge for us to, to take that thing off the throne of our hearts, out of the eyes of our hearts, and to place Jesus there. So we can be, <clears throat> we can be drawn into universal praise when we see the, the universal uh, extent of, uh, of Jesus' praise. We see the heights, we see the things in heaven, everything is praising him. You look around, it's praising him. You look at created universe, it's praising him. We see the depths, we see everything low here, and then we get to us, and we see that we can praise him. We can be drawn into that with how amazing he is, how worthwhile he is, how he creates and sustains us. Do we feel that pull? Do we feel that pull to take those other things out of the eyes of our hearts? off the throne of our, of our worship 
and to put Jesus there. Angels told the shepherds to go see Jesus. And they did. They left the sheep. They went and looked at Jesus. They went back to the sheep praising him. They saw Jesus. So I want us to look now. As we, do, as we do communion, I want us to see where this whole life started, ended, and rose again. We use this communion to remember our creator and sustainer, how he came as a child to save us, and he did that through his birth, death, and his resurrection. We see that his name is exalted above everything in the universe, and we also see him exalted on the cross as he took our sins and he died. So I'll ask Orville to come up and lead us in communion as we look to our horn of strength, our horn of salvation, and the thing that everything around us is praising. Thank you, Nick. Uh, 